do here at Marizonia? So at Marizonia we rescue animals that have been a victim of the wildlife trade. Uh, we have a lot of animals here that come from being illegal pets. They get mm. confiscated and they get brought to us. And we're one of the only wildlife rescue centres in Ecuador that's actually recognised by the government oh, of wow. a wildlife refuge um, as a wildlife rescue and rehabilitation centre. Mm. So that means whenever animals are actually confiscated from human homes, from places that they're being kept as pets, we're often the first place that the ministry calls to wow. bring the animals. Oh, brilliant. And what's the goal of having the animals here? Is it for them to live here for the rest of their lives or to eventually rehabilitate them and re-release them? So in an ideal world, the animals will be rehabilitated and returned to the wild eventually. This can vary in time depending on the species from a few weeks, even a few days if they're doing very well. But then it can also be years. So this is Frank, the founder of Marizonia. Frank, what was the vision behind setting up Marizonia? Our vision behind it was to create a place like a true place for animals to be re rehabilitated uh, in the jungle and also to create a place where um, volunteers can come and help and experience the jungle and help the animals as well. Mm. Combination, helping animals, helping people. And over the 17 years that marizonia has been here, what's the biggest thing you think you've learned? For me, as an animal person, like I said, I think the biggest thing I've learned is actually how you can influence people by doing this and like how you can touch them by showing them you can make a difference in the world. Amazing. So the animals that come to the refuge here, where have they come from? So most of the animals that we receive at Marizonia are victims of the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so that varies. Some of the animals are actually confiscated at the police checkpoint, which is very close to Marizonia. It's about 20 minutes down the road. Um, and this is animals that come directly from the Amazon. Um, what that means is often we have baby small monkeys that are arriving um, and their mothers have been shot in the wild for bushmeat which is terribly sad, and their baby monkeys, not being valuable enough to be sold as bushmeat, are then more valuable to be sold as pets. Um, so these monkeys can sometimes make it to people's homes, where they then are later found or have escaped from, and they get brought to us, or they are being transported out of the Amazon, and at these police checkpoints they are confiscated directly and as well brought to us. Um, so at the moment we have an all-time high of baby woolly monkeys in our care. Um, all of these individuals are below the age of about a year and a half. Most of them arrived to us between the ages of about two to three months, and this is exactly what happened to them. Their mothers were shot in the wild for bushmeat. They then consequently were brought to us after being sold as pets. Hello, are you doing me too? Hi. So this is Carlos. He's a very, very special case. He's talking to us right now. Um, he actually can't move very well. And when I say that, his legs here are basically almost non-functional. When he arrived, we're not quite sure exactly what had happened, but he, his legs had been broken in multiple places. He had a broken pelvis. Um, and he was found outside someone's house in a local town. <laughs> and he came to us and we thought, you know, like he's not moving around. This is a terrible life for a parrot. He also can't fly because his wings have been clipped. And we didn't really have too much hope for him, but we did start giving him baths because he was quite dirty on his like lower end. Gave him baths, gave him some enrichment in the form of like different like fruits, food, flowers, even toys. And he's now one of our happiest residents. And you walk past and he's talking to himself. Hello, my love. Hello, Carlos. He gets a bit shy when there's new people. Oh. Some, he really knows everyone individually and he'll know if he hasn't met someone before. Really? Yeah. And he loves being, I, I'm not going to try and tickle him now because when there's new people he gets quite shy and he can suddenly be a bit defensive because he doesn't quite know the situation. But when you get to know him and you're here by yourself, like, you tickle him, tickle his belly, take him out, put him on our knee and that's his enrichment too. He really loves space and human attention. And you will be amazed later on when we come back past here, it's likely that he'll be on the other side of the cage because his legs aren't totally useless. He can actually use his claws to hold on to the mesh, which is why we've got a mesh bottom for him. And he can pull himself along and he climbs up, he hangs onto these. Sometimes he's hanging from the roof of the cage, oh. singing to himself in the rain. Oh, Carlos! He's going to be a long-term resident. Yeah. He will stay here yeah. and just be loved. Exactly. Because oh, he, he's never going to be able to be released. He obviously can't fly. His legs aren't functional anymore. But he does live a happy life here and he has, like, you can see lots of different enrichments in his enclosure. I don't know if you know that word enrichment for animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so we talk yeah. about that a lot and it's basically enriching their lives in whatever means possible for that species. Yeah. And for him that means lots of different toys inside his cage. He gets flowers every day when we're out in the jungle. If you see a pretty flower, you take it for Carlos because he loves it. 
and he'll be singing to himself, saying hi when you go past in the morning. He's amazing. Oh, amazing. What a life! You get bought flowers every day. You love it. What have we got here? Uh, so we're about to go and see Isla. Um, she's a Tyra. Have you ever heard of a Tyra? Before? No. Ah, so they are very similar to Pine Martins, like we get in the UK. Oh, wow. They're a bigger version. So they're kind of, yeah, they're in the musculid fam musculid. They're in the musculid family. Um, and she is one that we actually received about a year and a half now. She came with another Tyra from a local zoo. Um, and the two of them, they've been living in separate enclosures. Um, but once they came here, they seemed to know each other quite well. And we thought, hey, let's try and introduce them. Introduce them and they got along really, really, really well. Wow. But Isla, out of the two, we had Isla and Grey. She was clearly the one who was more focused on humans. Grey had very good instincts. She was very scared of people and she was never interested when we came to the cage. Um, but we thought, hey, these two, if we give them about six months together and we attempt to release them, hopefully Grey will take Isla with her and Isla will kind of you know, follow her into the jungle and this could be a successful release mm. for them. This is what we tried and for Grey, she disappeared very quickly once we opened the enclosure. She disappeared off into the jungle, a huge success. We never mm. saw her again. Whereas Isla, within a couple of days, she was back at Marazonia, oh, looking her. in buckets, look, basically focused on anything that was human related, you yeah. know, buckets, gloves, people in general. So for her and her kind of happiness in mind, she didn't seem to be doing very well in the wild. She'd lost some weight. She was mm. starving when we gave her some food again. So for her, the best choice is actually to keep her in captivity. That doesn't mean she's going to live at Marizonia for the rest of her life, because for her, this is one of those difficult questions where she's taking up a resource that mm. could be used then to release another animal. And yeah. by resource, I mean the enclosure. So we actually have in mind right now that we're potentially going to transfer her to another center, which won't be releasing her, but she can live a happy life okay. and be in a different environment um, to Marizonia. So we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. We've got some different plans in store for her, okay. which and unfortunately is unlikely to involve release. Okay, but for now you're still trying to limit that human interaction just yeah. in case she starts to... Yeah, the thing, thing is, on. for her, it's quite clear that it's too far gone now. Okay. She is okay. very, very interested. It's unlikely that she's ever going to be released, but we do want to keep that window open. Yeah. And also just for her in terms of her happiness, she can, she is so interested in other enrichments. We, you're going to see her enclosure. She's got all sorts of things in there. Oh. She's got pools to fish in we catch her fish she's got vine hammocks to swing in she gets interesting enrichment every day from the volunteers in the means of her food she gets her food given to her in different ways every single day that you might be able to see later um, but in terms of the human interaction we just don't want to encourage any further development yeah. of that interest in humans yeah. so that means keeping our voices very low not speaking to her when we're at the cage and just to let her live in peace mm. and hopefully gradually move away from people mm. So who's this up here? <laughs> so this is Checkers, he's another one of our long-term residents. He's been with us for about 10 years. 10 years! Um, and he was actually rescued after being, well, not even rescued, he was being kept as a pet in a local town. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was terribly looked after, he might have been he might have come from a really loving home, but of course here in Ecuador, having wild animals as pets is totally illegal. Oh, okay. Um, so he was confiscated and brought to us, and his wings have been chopped quite severely, which meant he's never going to grow them back. He never actually learned to fly. So for him, <laughs> his life here at Marizonia is as free as he can be. He spends his days walking along these um, paths here. He's these are our walkways. These trails for yeah. him. And he wanders around, he goes up into the nearby trees and just does his thing. He yells at us all day, going, Hello! <laughs> he's getting really, really loud. He's a bit shy right now, but he'll probably do it before you leave. Hola! And he, he's really interesting because I one thing that I found amazing here when I started working more with wild animals, and especially parrots, is they are extremely picky in who they like. So these animals Ooh. here, they're all, um, we've got three birds, and they're all a um, exception to our hands-off policy. Okay. So it means they're never going to be released. They really do enjoy the human company and touch, so we do give that to them. Yeah. But it's a, a strict exception to that rule. Um, but check is, for example, he doesn't want that attention from me. He generally does not like women at all. Uh -huh. um, so I would be very crazy to go and give him my arm and to come onto my arm because he wouldn't be very nice. But then he has other favorites, volunteers, generally guys, <laughs> and he will happily go onto their shoulders, be really ridiculously cute, fluff up his feathers and... What does he yeah. think he can get from the guys that he can't get from They're the just girls? incredibly good at recognizing sexes. Like birds, really, they are very sexist and they will decide who they like. And even then, like, in terms of features, colors of hair, skin, everything. Mm. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, Margarita. Margarita. 
Hello, sweetheart. She's lovely. She, so she, she <laughs> might do a lot of Margarita. Can even. Oh, yeah, she's probably just going to come to you. There you go. Margarita. Hello, my love. Yeah, this is a new cousin. Nice to meet you. You can even give her a little tickle on the top of her head. Is she like Oh, no. Oh, she wants to see James. She shouldn't be on the ground, but she knows she's very safe here. She's lived with us for 12 years. She's been in Arizona. So, where did Margarita come from? So, Margaret, she's another one of the parrots that is an exception to our hands off rule. And this is because she arrived to us about 12 years ago now. Um, and she was a pet before coming here. She'd been a pet of an old lady for about 20 years. Um, so that makes her over 30 now, but these parrots can live to like 50 years old easily. So she's just a middle-aged um, bird at the moment. Um, but yeah, for Margaret, it was quite a difficult transition because she was kept with this lady for 20 years. That's a huge bond that these two individuals would have made. So it's not saying that Margaret was necessarily unhappy before she came here, but she's a wild animal and she can't live in a human home. Mm -hmm. So whatever reason it was, Margaret was brought here and that was quite an adjustment for her. She has that life of freedom here, even though she's not actually being able to fly and go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. She's got plenty of room here to roam and we make sure she's safe every night and she gets that love and attention oh, from her. people throughout the day. I'm so glad she found you. Yeah, we are too. And she's, yeah, she's one of our real OG residents. She's yeah. been here since 2010. And as you can see, she's in perfect condition. She yeah. isn't plucking out any of her feathers. She's fluffed up and happy. Have, having a happy life there. Yeah. And so something that's really important for us in Arizona is actually our hands-off policy. And now the hands-off policy doesn't only um, relate to touching the animals and interacting with the animals. It also relates to us uh, looking at the animals, talking quite loudly around the cages, because all of these kinds of interactions can be what really makes or breaks a release of an animal. The one thing that is extremely important is that the animals aren't humanized. If they are too humanized, generally release is ruled out. It's something that is extremely difficult to actually backtrack from. For an animal that arrives here, if they're really used to humans and they see humans for food, they see humans as a really positive interaction, in the wild that could be detrimental to their mm -hmm. safety when it comes to hunters, being captured again as a pet, or even just their survival. Yeah, yeah. Stories and their so we're going to go and see two monkeys, so it's Carlitos and Diego. Diego was the alpha for many years here at Marizonia, and he was in a group with many other monkeys. Um, but more recently, Carlitos took over him in his status of alpha, which is really interesting. But that does mean that we have two very big males who are living here together. And this shaking that you might hear, perfect timing, that is them displaying to us. They know you guys are new as well, they don't know you guys. And this is just them making sure that they're asserting to us their position in the hierarchy and they are strong. Um, adult male woolly monkeys are incredibly strong, definitely as strong as a human male, if not stronger. In terms of their body mass to muscle ratio, they are a force to be reckoned with. And also, Diego is well known at Marizonia as our most dangerous animal. Okay, cows, oh let's get cows reaction. Gosh. So you might as hell. Yeah. And when we have the fans, it's there for it. Wow. Been captive since young then, is that is that right? Uh, well, Carlitos, he arrived to us, oh, I don't know how many years ago it would be now, he's about seven, so he came to us, yeah, a bit less than 10 years ago. As a baby, he was confiscated at a checkpoint and he was, it was very recent that he'd been taken from his mum. And then for Diego, he came from a different centre. Mm. He, we're not exactly sure what had happened to him beforehand, but he'd been, been transferred a couple of times. And when he arrived here, he was an adult and he was terrified of women, absolutely terrified. Whenever you walk through his enclosure, he would just go down on the ground and hide himself oh, from any him. women who were around the cage. So he recognised the sex and it was women he was very fearful of. Mm. Men he was a lot more tolerant of, but he was still really scared of people. Mm. Um, but thankfully for Diego, he did have a success story in the way that he grew up into this beautiful, strong, bold male. He's really tentative and lovely with any of the babies. He's been an excellent surrogate dad over the oh, years. Brilliant. But unfortunately for him, his comfort zone is an enclosure, okay. which is heartbreaking. So we had to take Carly to San Diego after months of trying mm. to persuade them deeper into the jungle. We were giving them um, supplemented diets, so we were giving them food on these feeders, taking them and trying to lead them deeper into the jungle, but these two, they weren't having it. And it's for them, it became a decision of their happiness. Mm. We think happiness equals freedom, mm. but for these two, actually, happiness is really sadly in an enclosure. Okay. 
Um, so we have plans for them. We haven't given up totally. We've been trying to raise some money for an open air enclosure oh, over the last couple of years. So that will be somewhere where they can be in the jungle but exactly. still feel like they're being looked after. So exactly. you still feed them but they still have... Yeah, that would be exactly it. So we would have basically very natural structures like big trees, vines, mm. all sorts of things for them to keep them busy. And that might not only be a place for them to be forever, it might actually be an intermediate place that they could go before mm. giving the lease a try again for them later. Mm. But it's all a matter of resources, money, and for the moment we've got our focus on a different release, but we haven't forgotten about Amazing. these guys. And you're saying that they sometimes act as surrogate fathers for the young woolly monkeys. So these guys are here in this enclosure right now, but do you introduce other monkeys to them? So okay. that was over the years. Unfortunately now, because we've given that release a try and mm -hmm. because we've noticed their behaviours, they don't have the ideal behaviours to actually be teaching any sure. young monkeys. Yeah. So what we've done now is we've actually separated them from the rest of the group because yeah. we've got another group of seven, which is five babies and two adults okay. that are actually set to be released next year, oh, and, which is really exciting. Yeah. You're going to meet them. Um, and that's where we've got the all-time high of baby woolly monkeys. Yeah. So that's a very interesting dynamic for a release, but we're yeah. very hopeful for it. And they formed their own little family group yeah. that can be released together. Yeah, Amazing. exactly. Well, should we go and have a look? Yeah, we should go and have a look. Told me that my heart's going to explode when we see this next thing. So what is this next thing? So this next thing is we're going to go and see our baby woolly monkeys group. Now we've got seven individuals, two adults and five babies. And this is something that I mentioned earlier about having an all-time high of baby woolly monkeys right now. Now we can't say for sure, but what we are quite certain of is this is a knock-on effect from the pandemic. With limited resources, money and jobs in Ecuador, there was a turn to illegal activities, which includes deforestation, the hunting of animals for bush meat, and as a result, we had quite a few babies arrive into our care. Uh, the positive thing is they're all doing amazingly well. We've managed to bring them together to form a cohesive group of five youngsters and two adults, and they're all set to be released next year. So one thing that we've just discovered is Louisa, our on-site vet, is actually here with another baby. She's called Shimmy, and she's our most recent arrival. If all goes well, we're going to be introducing Shimmy to the rest of the group, and she is going to go with them into the wild, hopefully on the back of Carmenia, who's an adult that I'm going to show you. So what's Louisa doing here with Shimmy? So Louisa right now, she's acting as a oh, She really likes being on camera, apparently. Um, Louise is acting as a surrogate mum for Shimmy because Shimmy's only about three months old. She's very small, as you can see, compared mm. to the others. Um, and this is so important for the development of a baby primate, especially woolly monkeys. If they don't have this close interaction with either their own species or a human, doing it right and well, um, she would find it very, very difficult to grow into a well-rounded, confident monkey with the necessary skills such as climbing, the right leaves to eat, all sorts of behaviours that they aren't born with. We try to teach them those behaviours and once she's ready and once she's gotten to the point where we think she's ready to go out alone, we will introduce her to her own species and okay. step back from that human contact. So for the moment she's kept separately to the other woolly monkeys, yes. just for her own protection? For her own protection for sure. They're all very gentle and chances are if we introduce her to them right now there would be no aggression mm -hmm. but what there would be is her really struggling to hold her own because she's yeah. very small she's tiny. she needs the reassurance and comforts of a surrogate yeah. so if Carmenia takes her under her wing and plays that role we will very soon be stepping back and that's one thing that I found amazing when I first started working here I thought how on earth could you have a baby like this yeah. and introduce it to a group why wouldn't they want to come back to you but they don't it's beautiful, mm -hmm. yeah. They sometimes there's a little bit of it in you know, an in-between phase where they might be a bit confused, like yeah. who do I go to? But mm -hmm. very quickly they realise like, hey, you guys are my gang. Incredible. You understand me like that other thing didn't. <laughs> so I'm going to stick with you guys. So you've just seen Shimmy, an absolutely adorable tiny little woolly monkey, and obviously for us humans, it's really cute to see that and really beautiful, and you want to kind of give them a cuddle, mm -hmm. but that's not the idea, is it? So. What is it like for you guys working here to interact with the babies like mm. this? Well, interacting with the babies is one of, well, without a doubt, the most beautiful experience that I've had here at Marizonia working with the animals. But it's beautiful and also heartbreaking. You spend these days with these monkeys and they look to you for this reassurance, for the comfort. They depend on you implicitly, which is, of course, such an honour and it's so humbling. 
but they shouldn't be looking to humans for that. So it's actually incredibly sad to see that these monkeys have been left in this position where they've been taken from their natural habitat. They would be acting like this with their mum and they were so close. Mm. But then their mum was shot and they ended up as a pet and they were brought to us. Mm. So thankfully we can provide them with this reassurance that they need and provide that, provide them with that really important relationship that they would mm. get. But it's just a step in their rehabilitation. For me, actually, in terms of experiences, that's beautiful in itself, the, the um, interaction. But the most rewarding is seeing them be introduced to their own species yeah. and to see them interact with their own kind and to see them not care about you anymore. <laughs> they, they see you in the, like, around the cages and go, I don't care about you. You don't understand me the way they do. Yeah. And that's, that's really what makes it all worth it. Yeah. And those experiences that you've had and the volunteers have had, that can shape people, can't it? To have that interaction, that bond with another animal for a different species. Yeah. I think especially with primates, which are so close to humans. Definitely. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so I think Marizonia, of course, we've changed the lives of so many animals. There's been hundreds of, rea- of animals that have come through here over the years and who have been successfully released. But I think one thing that Marizonia will always be remembered for and something that really captured my heart is how much it changed, changes the lives of the volunteers that come and spend time with us. Because these volunteers, they might have been thinking about dipping into maybe veterinary science. They're thinking it could be an option for them moving forward or something conservation related. But I think so many volunteers leave here knowing solidified and they they know what path they're going to take career-wise and that is the bigger change that Marizonia mm-hmm. is responsible for. Yeah, amazing. So what have we got here? <laughs> so these are two of our red howler monkeys in rehab and um, they're two of our youngsters and they are part of our red howler rehabilitation program. It's something that we're very, very proud of at Marizonia because red howler monkeys are notoriously sensitive in captivity. Any slight changes in their environment, in their habitat, can affect them drastically. Okay. Um, so we're very lucky to have successfully released three in the past. Well, four actually. One of them then ended up going off and doing her own thing at a later date. But we've got three now that are successfully released and roaming the Marizonia Reserve. Wow. And so they stay quite local? Yeah, so because they are so sensitive, it's really, really important that we actually supplement the diets okay. of the howlers. So for the first couple of years of their release, we were supplementing their diets and just keeping an eye on them. So just leaving food out for them? Yeah, we have set feeders around the reserve, mm. which we were feeding them from. Recently, for about a year and a half, we stopped feeding them and they were doing really, really well. But we also recently had a shift in status of the alpha, and that meant that the alpha female in Moya, she stepped down, and Ruby, a younger individual who is second in command, took over. And Ruby has a very different way of running the group, and she thought, hey, let's go and take um, advantage of Marizonia and their buckets that lie around (laughs) the other cages, and she has a much more forceful way of uh, leading the group. So they've been coming back a little bit more so than we'd like recently. So we've started attracting them away from Arizona again. And it's fine. It's all a fluid kind of process. Um, And then one day we're hoping that these guys might join them in the wild. And these guys, what's really interesting about howlers is they are one of our most sensitive species when it comes to diet and leaves. So these guys consume about 70% of their diet is made up of leaves, but not just any leaves. The other animals, we have rules for leaves and certain things that they like, but for these guys, it is very, very strict on what leaves they get. Uh, That means that our volunteers spend hours per day (laughs) adventuring in the jungle, finding all the right leaves for them, and they get very perfectly hand-picked leaves delivered to their enclosure three times a day. What a life! to see next next we have puma pangi um, and pangi is a big cat who has been with us since 2011 um, she unfortunately was always unreleasable it was never really an option to release her into the wild and that is because she was sadly a tourist attraction before she came here she was kept in a hostel uh, in a place called rio bamba which is a couple of hours from here along with about 30 to 40 other animals varying from other small mammals and then other big cats like pumas they had, they had birds coatis all sorts and they were all tourist attractions, so people were staying there, seeing the animals. And Pangi, she was in an enclosure so small that it was hardly even possible for her to turn around. Mm-hmm. And she'd been there apparently for about four years. Uh, so for her, she was an adult female. She was terribly malnourished. She had hardly any muscle development. She could hardly sustain her own body weight while standing and walking around. 
So she arrived here in pretty horrific condition, mm -hmm. also terrified of people having been severely traumatised by living in such horrendous conditions. Mm -hmm. Thankfully here, within a year, she was bouncing around the cage. She was oh. leaping three metres high, four metres. You'll see her now, she's incredibly agile. But just the proximity that she had spent close to humans mm -hmm. for this amount of time meant that she will never be safe to release. The costs of releasing her risk-wise are too high. Uh, and that comes down to the fact that although maybe she's scared of humans and perhaps she wouldn't interfere with any you know, local human towns, she wouldn't go anywhere near to see people, she could potentially go near to hunt animals to find easy access to food in farmlands, mm -hmm. places like this. And that's actually a big problem in Ecuador in terms of human animal conflict for big cats especially mm. so the risk for her is too high to return to the wild unfortunately so tell us about goliath so Goliath is a very unusual arrival that we had here at Marizonia a couple of months ago. Um, and he is a giant anteater. Now, anteaters aren't often kept as pets, thankfully, but the one reason that we often receive them is because of the fact that they are crossing roads, they often get into road traffic accidents, and unfortunately, the babies that are clinging to the mother's backs can then be left alone and vulnerable. So they're handed over to the Ministry of Environment and we receive them. So we've received a few tamanduas in the past, which are smaller anteaters, but we recently received our first ever giant anteater, which is Goliath. And I say, I do this because he's three months old and he's already bigger than our other tamandua adults that we've rehabilitated in the past. He's drinking incredible amounts of goat's milk per day, 400 mils to be exact, that he gets in five different installments. Um, and that's because in the wild, he should still be getting that from his mum. So thankfully he was found somewhere close to a road um, near Cuyabeno, a rainforest reserve down in the deeper Amazon basin. And he was brought to us. And the plan for him is that we will keep him here until he's fully weaned off of milk, which he would be receiving for the first at least 10 to 12 months of his life. Um, and then he will be released back into the rainforest close by Cuyabeno. And why have we seen Goliath taking a lift on one of the volunteers' backs? <laughs> so for Goliath, because in the wild, a very normal behavior that he would be doing is being carried by his mum on her back. She would be traveling distances through the jungle and he would be clinging to her back. This is the safest and actually most normal way for him to be transported around Marizonia. And when I say around Marizonia, that's because he only sleeps in his enclosure overnight. He spends his nights there snuggled up with lots of cozy blankets and pillows in a box that we made for him. And then every single day, as the weather permits, he's taken out with a volunteer on their back initially to transport him away from the busy volunteer area um, and they take him off into the jungle and we let him forage do his own thing and as soon as he's off in the jungle and his surrogate mum for the day sits herself down or himself he'll climb off and he'll forage he'll do his own thing and he's been consuming incredible amounts of ants oh. recently and tasty big grubs he's not a huge fan of termites nests but he has his specific species that he likes so mm -hmm. he finds them and he raids the nest and then we move on to the next destination with him amazing so you're basically teaching him all the things that his mother would have taught him. Exactly. Yeah. And for us at Marizoni, we do have a really strict hands-off policy whenever mm. we can. So for most of the animals, this means no interaction with them. But for animals like himself and also our baby primates, this interaction is actually incredibly vital for their rehabilitation. Mm. So for Goliath, this contact, he's not seeing that person as a human being that he's being kept as a pet by. He's just seeing it as, okay, well, this is my mode of transport for the day. This <laughs> is my mum. And he goes off with them into the jungle. Mm. But as he gets older, we will start making ourselves a little bit more distant from him, changing the rehab technique so that as he gets bigger and also more dangerous, because although he doesn't mean any pain, he has incredibly strong claws on his, in, on his front arms. Um, yeah, we will be starting to distance ourselves a little bit from him so that we can be ready to be released when he's older. Amazing. So what could people at home do to help you guys and the animals here at Marizona? So a major thing that people can do is donate. Uh, now we're a non-profit organisation and donations are so, so, so important to the work we do. With more funds, we can not only continue the work we do, but it can make Marizonia more sustainable long term. And I think there are so many animals that need our help. They need this phase of their rehabilitation. They need this stepping stone to go back into the wild. And we can only do that if we have the support behind us financially.